You know what? Fuck it. We're partying in Tampa Bay, baby. It don't matter that they lost the World Series. The Rays are finally a good team. For the past 10 years, the people of St. Pete have been hungry for a winner. And now they got one. They're so happy. They're expressing their fanhood in the only logical way. By making YouTube fan songs. Okay, uh, quick side tangent. Going down this rabbit hole was kind of insane. You won't believe how many songs there are. I mean, you know, there's the ones that are semi-popular. They got a good amount of views. Then there's these ones that are just sort of buried in there. Like, what's happening here? I don't know what this is. What's this one about? <laughs> it, there's just, they just keep going. They just keep coming. There's so many of them. Santa Claus, I don't want my two front teeth for Christmas. I want bling bling. On the field, the team didn't end up making that many changes. Baldelli, Floyd, and Hinsky all left in free agency. To replace them, Edwin Jackson was swapped for Matt Joyce, and Pat Burrell came over to the team that he helped beat. Jeff Neiman, who had made some appearances in 08, slotted in well in the rotation along with Garza, Shields, and Casimir. Price, who was initially optioned to Durham, also contributed some good innings, along with Andy Sonenstein, a guy who's been here since 07, but I haven't mentioned him yet because uh, he wasn't that good. Casimir, who was an all-star the previous season, regressed hard in 09 and ended up falling to the number four slot. Eventually, in August, he would be traded to the Angels. A deal that almost ended up not happening due to confusion between him and the team. During his time here, Casimir became the team leader in strikeouts and wins. And while he would have some success in Oakland and LA, he would never again reach the heights of his time in Tampa Bay. One last footnote though, after a four year hiatus caused by injuries and wanting to focus on family, Casimir would make one last return in 2021 on the Giants. A nice end to his story. Dwayne Stats had been the voice of the Rays ever since day one, and in 2009 he would be joined by Kevin Kennedy and Brian Anderson. While Kennedy didn't stay for very long, BA would remain as color commentator, and the two are still calling games to this day. The radio station would also change to 620 WDAE, with Andy Freed and Dave Wills continuing to call games. They've been at it since 04. They, along with everyone else, were eager to see how the Rays were going to follow up their World Series run, as the window for contention suddenly seemed wide open. Well, 2009 didn't turn out to be as good as anyone hoped, as the team sputtered right out of the gate, going 9-14 in April. They were able to rectify it a bit in June by going 19-7, but by then, both the Yankees and Red Sox were a solid distance away. And by the end of the year, the five-game gap by the beginning of September was simply too much to overcome. And they missed the playoffs at 84 and 78. But it wasn't all bad, as while guys like Upton regressed a little, and Aki missed most of the season due to a leg injury, Longo, Bartlett, and Crawford all had excellent seasons with him stealing six bases in one game against Cleveland. The throw not in time. Carl Crawford steals his sixth base of the afternoon. They also got some good help from another unlikely candidate, Ben Zobrist, who had been a middling bench slash utility player previously, jumped out as the opening second baseman after Aki's injury. Along with putting up impressive hitting numbers, his defense has greatly improved mostly helped by the fact that he could play anything. No, literally. He played every position except catcher in 09. In one funny incident, Madden had Longo and Zobrist listed as the third baseman, with no DH. So because of this, Sonenstein had to hit. 
and he ended up doing pretty well actually, going one for three that day. On June 28th, the Rays became the fastest team to hit 100 homers and steal 100 bases. Mostly thanks to Crawford, who stole 60 total bases in 09, and Pena, who at one point led the AL in homers and finished with 39. Speaking of Pena, he almost missed out on the All-Star game, being left to the finals vote, where a team campaign did everything they could to get him in. But he ended up losing to the Tigers' Brandon Inge. Nonetheless, he got in anyway as a replacement for Pedroia. Crawford ended up being the MVP of the game, and Pena took part in the home run derby, smashing Longo's previous record of three homers with five, which was apparently good enough for fourth place? July saw both a big high and a huge low, as on the 23rd, the Rays got perfect gamed by Mark Burley and the White Sox. And just two days later, they achieved the largest comeback in franchise history coming down from 9-1 to win in extras against Toronto. An 11-game losing streak in September all but killed their playoff hopes, combined with Pena going down with fractured fingers. But hey, Upton managed to give the team one last good story as he became the first Ray to hit for the cycle a couple days before the season ended. To say this year was a disappointment would be an understatement, as for the first time, the Rays actually had expectations and failed to meet them. Going from winning the pennant to missing the playoffs is one thing, but finishing only a few games over 500 was a bit worrying. However, the team still had confidence in themselves that they could win, and heading into 2010, they looked to prove 2008 wasn't just a fluke. With Crawford's $10 million option being accepted, someone had to bite the bullet, and that guy was Aki Iwamura. The man who won the ALCS for the Rays was shipped off to Pittsburgh in exchange for Jesse Chavez, who then himself got traded to Atlanta for Rafael Soriano. Dan Johnson, who spent 09 in Japan, was brought back on a one-year deal. And guess who else is back? Yep, Baldelli spent one year in the hellhole that is Boston and decided he wanted to come home though only as a special assistant, and very unlikely to actually play ball. Uh-huh, yeah, sure. To round things out, Zobrist, following his incredible 09 campaign, was given a five-year extension. They wanted to add, oh, a shot deep! Down the left side, and... A 473-foot Longoria homer on opening day would set the tone early, as unlike last year's sluggish April... This year, the Rays dominated, going 17 and 6, the best April record since the Yankees went 21 and 6 seven years prior. Their torrid start wouldn't prevent them from somehow getting perfected again, this time by Dallas Braden of the Athletics. However, they were still able to continue winning in May, despite Howell having to miss the entire season. Their success was, of course, due to the likely suspects. Longo, Pena, and Crawford, all continuing their elite level of play. Longoria was busy enjoying the spotlight as he quickly became the face of the franchise. Hell, he even had a commercial that went viral with this totally real catch. But the real star of the show was David Price, who had an amazing year as the new number one starter, good enough for second place in Cy Young voting, behind some guy named Felix Hernandez. Yeah. He's overrated anyway. They wouldn't be the only ones doing the hard work, as they would be complemented by two new faces. John Jaso had been a part of the organization ever since he got drafted in 03. And after spending a long time in the minors, and after a brief stint in 08, he would become a full-time starter in 2010. Immediately, he put up good numbers both next to and behind the plate, which served well as Navarro would end up being sent down to Durham. His efforts were good enough to get him Rookie of the Year votes, and while he didn't end up winning, he still served as a solid presence at catcher. The other was a man acquired from the Angels, Sean Rodriguez. Aside from also hitting well, he served as another great utility man to compliment Zobers, as he would be seen all over the field making great plays. Together, 
Him and Jaso would put up over six war, contributing as solid depth pieces for the team's strong core. June ended up being the weakest month as they went under 500, including getting no hit for the third time in two years, this time by former pitcher Edwin Jackson. But they were able to rebound with an even better July. And to finally break the curse, Matt Garza would throw the first, and so far only, no hitter in franchise history. He's gonna get it! Zobras makes the catch and this game is over! Matt Garza has faced 27 hitters and has thrown a no hitter! Despite heading into September 30 games over 500, they still trailed the Yankees for the division lead, but the race still remained close heading into the final month of the season. They got some help with rookie pitcher Jeremy Hellickson, Desmond Jennings, and oh, Baldelli. I knew you couldn't stay off the field. He did only end up playing 10 games before ultimately hanging it up. But hey, at least he was able to come home. And now he's the manager of the Twins. Rafael Soriano was having an absolute dominant year, throwing 45 saves, a new franchise record, including a crucial win against New York on September 15th. The Rays would go 4-3 against the Yanks that month, and they would remain within two games of each other up until the final game of the season, Game 162, where they were tied for the division lead. In rather anticlimactic fashion, the Red Sox had already defeated the Yankees before the Rays even started playing, leading to them once again being crowned division champs. Well, winning 96 games is one way to show they were legit, but of course, the real test comes in October, as the Rays prepare for their second trek up the mountain, this time beginning against the Texas Rangers. Unlike every other opponent they face in the playoffs, the Rangers have been historically bad for pretty much as long as they've been around, as they hadn't won a title in their entire 48-year existence. If it was a time to make another deep run, it would be this. Well, it wouldn't take long for things to go sour, as the Rays had a chance in the first, but a terrible call on by the ump led to Pena being called out on strikes and Baldelli soon followed. Price, who had been solid all year, surrendered RBIs to Jeff Francoeur and Benji Molina, followed by two more homers to quickly form a 5 nothing hole the Rays couldn't escape from. In Game 2, Shields got into trouble early with a bad pickoff throw leading to a run scoring. In the fourth, with the Rays desperate to get out of a jam, Chad Qualls appeared to get Michael Young out on a strikeout that would have ended the inning, had it not been for the ump somehow ruling that he checked his swing. Of course, the very next pitch he would send one deep, leading to a very angry Joe Madden. All of a sudden, the Rays are on the brink of elimination. With their backs against the wall, the series moved to Arlington, where a Mitch Moreland RBI put the Rangers up early. However, the bats finally came out to play, as Upton, Pena, and Jaso would combine to give the Rays a 3-2 lead heading into the ninth, where Crawford and Pena would put the game away, sealing a 6-3 win. In Game 4, Pena continued where he left off with a triple in the second that later scored on an error. And with some help from Longo, the Rays are able to put up a 5-0 lead. The Rangers were able to threaten with a couple runs, but Soriano was able to shut them down for the second straight game, forcing a decisive Game 5 at the drop. However, when hope seemed to have been renewed, Cliff Lee destroyed hopes and dreams, as he pitched a complete game, giving up only six hits. Price, on the other hand, did well enough, only giving up three runs, 
but with the offense it being absolutely suffocated, it just wasn't good enough. And Ian Kinsler homer in the ninth put it away, as the Rays saw their great season end early. Upton pops it up. Left side, Elvis Andrus is backpedaling. He is under it. He puts it away. And the Texas Rangers have won a postseason series for the first time in franchise history. And move on to the American League Championship Series to face the New York Yankees. Was this their best chance? Was the window beginning to close? Well, it certainly seemed that way as the great fire sale of 2011 began. Carlos Pena would sign with the Cubs, who also ended up getting Matt Garza in a trade that gave the Rays a bunch of prospects. Their star closer, Rafael Soriano, signed with the Yankees of all teams. Jason Bartlett traded to the Padres, but the worst of all, came to their beloved superstar. Carl Crawford, the man who they literally moved the stadium wall down for, would sign, at the time, one of the largest paid contracts in MLB history. A seven-year, $142 million deal with the fucking Red Sox of all teams. To lose the face of a franchise is one thing, but to watch him go to your arch rival, and that, eh, it hurts. But hey, to make up for it, the Rays signed Johnny Damon and Manny Ramirez. Oh boy, yeah, that aged incredibly poorly. As while Damon ended up being a rental who provided decent value. Ramirez played five whole games before being suspended for illegal substance usage, and he never played for the Rays again. Twenty eleven began with a dreadful 0 and six start, the worst in franchise history. But they quickly rebounded by going fifteen and six to finish April with a winning record including an absolute clobbering of Boston 16-5, who, funnily enough, would also start the season 0-6. That game would be pitched by Jeremy Hellickson, who had garnered some time in 2010, but transformed into a reliable starter this year, putting up his best career numbers and earning Rookie of the Year, along with Price, Shields, Wade Davis, and Jeff Neiman, the rotation would end up being one of the best in baseball by year's end. The team treaded water in May, going 14-13, settling around the middle of the pack. Brandon Geyer, a call-up to replace Neiman's roster spot after he got injured, would homer in his first at-bat, and he got at least a bit of time before inevitably being sent back down. Ironically, he's most well known for being hit. A lot. In fact, he's the most hit player of all time, with a minimum of 500 plate appearances. Despite putting up solid wins, the team was unable to find the consistency they had in previous years, often trading wins and losses. At the end of June, they sat at 45-36, and 36, which, while a respectable record, still left them in third place behind the Yankees and Red Sox because, of course, a reoccurring theme, if you will, as the Rays would be first place in the AL Central. But, of course, they're stuck with these two assholes. As Price and Shields ended up ineligible to pitch, the Rays' lone All-Star representative would be Matt Joyce, a man who was quietly having a solid year, and while he would never have a better year than this one, he still played well enough to earn a starting role. Damon had also settled well into his role as the DH, and while he would only stay for one season, he would hit 16 homers and 73 RBIs. Good enough for a rental. They could be a lot worse, trust me. In July 17th, the Rays once again faced the Red Sox in what would become an absolute shit show of a game. 
the offense went completely limp for both teams as the game headed into extras scoreless. Madden ended up being ejected due to a check swing call, and the measly raised offense was only able to put up three hits all game. Yeah, it went for 16 innings. Imagine watching a five and a half hour game only to see the most feeble offense of all time, not even score a single run. Man, I sure hope that never happens again. An ugly July would lead to the division race being all but sealed, as the Rays sat ten and a half games behind Boston, and eight and a half out of the wild card. August saw the Rays begin to put themselves together, with a pair of five game winning streaks to boost themselves up a bit, but things were looking to be too little too late. On September second, the Rays sat at seventy four and sixty three. Nine games behind Boston for the wild card, the Red Sox had a 99.4% chance to make the playoffs, with the race hopes practically flatlining. But hey, anything's possible. I just gotta take it one game at a time. Two strong series wins against Baltimore and Texas would set up a crucial three-game set at home against Boston, who was just coming off a brutal four-gamer against Toronto, where they lost three out of four. On the ninth, with the series set to kick off, the lead had shrunken to six and a half games. Game one saw Wade Davis put on an absolutely electric performance, throwing a complete game and only allowing six hits in a 7-2 win. The next night saw things go down to the wire, as the teams traded runs until the Rays entered the ninth with a 5-3 lead. That lead would soon vanish as back-to-back homers would tie the score up heading into extras. However, Boston wouldn't get another man on base, and in the 11th, Jennings would launch a ball into deep center that led to a triple, and Longoria would finish it up with a liner. To wrap a nice little bow on things, Shields would pitch a dominant game the next day, throwing eight and a third innings of one-run ball, as the offense absolutely bullied the Boston pitching, as Upton would crush a monster slam in the fifth to put this game away. In a huge series, the Rays would sweep the Red Sox, capping off a stretch where a Rays five-game winning streak perfectly coincided with Boston's five-game losing streak, leading to the lead being only three and a half games. It wouldn't be long before the two teams met again, just a few days later for a four-gamer in Boston, with the lead sitting at four games. Game one saw more of the same, with Hellickson and the bullpen doing their part in shutting down Boston's offense, and another Longoria homer would open up a big cushion that the Rays held onto for the win. The next night saw a close affair, with the Longo homer being answered by a couple RBIs, and heading into the fourth with the game tied at three, Mike Aviles would hit a huge fly ball to deep left that would go over the monster to give Boston the lead. The Rays had some chances to answer back, with Damon stealing two bases to get to third, but they would be unable to come back this time, and Boston earned their first win against the Rays in September. Jeff Neiman took the mound on the 17th, knowing the stakes as every win mattered, and he put on a solid performance, only two runs allowed as the offense was able to build a 4-2 lead. With Joel Peralta coming in for the save, he fanned the first two hitters before allowing a man on with a hit, but he was able to get the last out, as the Rays won a crucial Game 3. But even more importantly came Game 4, the last time these two teams would face each other, and an offensive explosion in the second set the tone early as the Rays jumped out to a 3-0 lead. Darnell McDonald was able to make it close, cutting it down to 4-2 in the fourth, but the Rays were able to respond quickly, building up an 8-2 lead, thanks to efforts from Zobrist, Upton, and Joyce. 
A Mike Veal's homer briefly made it interesting by making it 8-5, but Peralta would once again come up big, closing the door on Boston's comeback and securing the series win. Going 6-1 against Boston in September was absolutely critical, as the Rays sat at 85-67 after the 18th, going 11-6 in September thus far. Boston, on the other hand, was absolutely imploding, going 5-13 in the same stretch, and the lead had shrunk from 9 games to 2, with 10 left to play. Still though, the odds heavily favored Boston making the playoffs, and they would continue to grow, as the Rays' momentum was halted by the Yankees, who won 3 in a row against them before the Rays were able to salvage the last game of the series. Luckily for them, Boston had also lost 3 out of 4 against Baltimore. The Red Sox had so many chances to pull away, but at every opportunity, they were shitting themselves, going on a historically bad run. They would welcome the Yankees to town and lose 2 out of 3 again, while the Rays would win 2 out of 3 against Toronto. The following day, on the 26th, the Rays would beat the Yankees at home, and Boston would again lose to Baltimore and the lead was completely erased, as both teams sat at 89 and 71. The Yankees had already wrapped up the division at this point, and Baltimore had already been eliminated, so both really had nothing to play for, as the Rays and Red Sox would win on the 27th. Although Baltimore did make it interesting at the end by almost coming back. And thus, on the final day of the season, both teams sat at 90 and 71 as they prepared for a game 162. Heading into today, Boston still had a 59.4% chance to make the playoffs. That night, as both games began at the same time, both teams' playoff odds hung in the balance. And tonight, they will take on the New York Yankees, trying to sweep New York and move ahead of the Boston Red Sox who play tonight in Baltimore. Rays trying to keep the pressure on the Red Sox. David Price, who was otherwise having a good year, struggled right off the bat, as Robinson Cano would score off a bad throw, and he quickly got into another hole in the third as the Yanks had the bases loaded with two outs, as Mark Teixeira came up to the plate. All he needed to do was get him out, and this would be over. And he almost got him, until... 3-2, there's a shot hit deep into left center field. That ball's got some carry, and it's gone. It was a 3-2 fastball with plenty on it, and Teixeira hits a grand slam. The absolute worst possibility, as the Yankees jumped out to a 5-0 lead, plummeting the Rays' win probability to 11%. Price would leave the game after four innings after giving up another to share a homer, and in the fifth, Andrew Jones would add on with another, as the lead expanded to 7-0. The Rays, at this point, had just a 2% chance of winning. Despite things looking grim, they still had good hopes, as if both teams lost, they would play a one-game tiebreaker at the trot. In Baltimore, a close affair was brewing, as Dustin Pedroia would open the scoring on a grounder to center. However, the O's would answer with a towering homer by J.J. Hardy to put them up front. But as the Yanks built their monstrous lead, Mike Aviles would score on a bulk, tying the game at two and Pedroia would hit another homer to give Boston the lead in the fifth. Baltimore had a chance to answer with two men on and nobody out, but a double play it would quickly end that threat as they held the lead into the seventh. That's when Mother Nature intervened as the rain began to fall on Camden Yards, and in the bottom of the seventh, the game would be suspended, leaving the Sox to watch the Rays in the clubhouse. Even still, they had a 56% chance of winning, while the Rays, in the top half of the seventh, hovered just around 1%, as they were simply unable to get anything going. In the bottom half, they had two men on with Russ Kanzler up to bat, but he too would go down, which all but sealed this one up. 
The Rays were down seven going into the eighth and had a 0.3% chance of winning. <sighs> well, it was a good run, but it looks like their luck has just run out. I mean, it was a long shot anyway. But now all we can do is hope that Baltimore is able to pull through. But that game isn't coming on anytime soon. I guess we're just stuck watching this nightmare. Even the Boston announcers are calling the coronation. What do you think the odds are that the Rays rally in this game? I think the Rays are not going to win tonight. I think that the one thing that we have eliminated tonight is the Red Sox season is not going to end tonight. In the eighth, Damon leads off and is able to get on with a blooper into shallow center. Then Zobrist is able to knock one down the left field line for a double. The next man, Casey Kochman, ends up getting hit. And now the Rays have the best chance of the night, with the bases loaded and nobody out. Wowee! The win percentage has jumped to an astounding 3%. That brings Sam Fold to the plate. A man who I haven't mentioned at all yet, but he had an alright year. But notably, he didn't strike out very often, which was nice. The Yanks would make a substitution, bringing in Luis Ayala, who is somehow their ninth pitcher of the night. Guess they were having a bullpen night before that even became a thing. He got off rough going down 3-0, before working it back to 3-2. But the next pitch is low allowing Fold to walk and the Rays finally to get on the board. Amazingly, this brings the win percentage to an incredible 6%. Wish it could have done this sooner. The next hitter is Sean Rodriguez, who quickly goes down to 0-2. But then... And he's hit! Ayala hit him with a pitch. That's going to force home a run. The Rays make it 7-2. Okay, it's 7-2 now and the win percentage is up to 12%. Jennings is able to work the count to three and two, but he swings and misses as the Yankees are able to get the first out. Now they sit a double play away from ending this rally. Upton steps up and in typical Upton fashion, he wastes no time, launching one to left field. It doesn't go far enough though, landing safely in the glove of Jones. Though Kochman is able to tag up, now the deficit is 7-3. to three. However, the Rays have two outs. So if there's any time to make something happen, it's now. now I wonder who's coming up to the plate. Three run inning. 7-3 to three now. Evan Longoria will bat. In the biggest at-bat of the season, Evan Longoria steps in. And Dwayne Stats, who is no stranger to crazy race moments, drops this gem. It would be fun, just for fun, to be in a long one. Oh! It would be fun, but, ah, uh, it'll never happen. And there it is! Long drive! Deep to left! We have a ball game, as all of a sudden the deficit shrinks to just one run. Now, where have I seen this before? However, as Jaso hits a single, Damon is unable to capitalize, and the Rays enter the ninth, down one with only a 10% chance to win. The Yankees send in Corey Wade, a man who'd only given up nine runs all year, and he makes quick work of Zobrist, who pops on the center and Kochman, who grounds out. And now the Rays are down to their final out. Sam Fold, the next man up, prepares to walk out, but he's subbed out for Dan Johnson. Aside from having that one moment in 08, has been very not good. Having a bad year in the few games he did appear in. Midway through the season, he was even DFA'd and spent quite a lot of time in Durham. Now, why would they bring in this guy at this time? Well, Dan Johnson is coming up for one reason, and one reason only. Hit the ball out of the ballpark. 
Funnily enough, Wade and Johnson both spent time together in Durham earlier this year, before Wade was shipped off to New York. It's just such a raised move to trust him potentially the entire season in an old journeyman. And tonight, once again, the baseball gods would smile upon Dan Johnson. Johnson hits it down the right field line. That ball's going to be fair and gone. Dan Johnson does it again. He had a magic moment in 08 against Jonathan Papelbon. And he lines a pinch hit home run to tie this game in the bottom of the ninth inning here against New York. We had Crawford's corner, and now we have Johnson's corner. And while the fans in St. Pete were busy losing their minds, the Red Sox were forced to watch the Rays come all the way back to tie it, just as the rain was starting to let up. An hour and a half ago, it was looking very likely that Boston would at least play a game 163, but now that wasn't looking so sure. As the game resumed in Baltimore, reliever Troy Patton got off to a rough start perhaps frazzled by the sudden pressure of the Rays' comeback as he hit two batters in the seventh before getting out of it. Still, things looked somewhat comfortable as Daniel Bard was able to take care of business and Boston entered the bottom of the ninth, still holding on to their one-run lead. Meanwhile, what was once a snooze fest had quickly transformed into a nail-biting thriller as the game moved into extras. Kyle Farnsworth was able to shut down a minor threat in the 10th, but neither team's offense was having much going for them until the 12th. With two quick singles, suddenly the Yankees had first and third with no outs, and it was up to Jake McGee to keep the game tied, facing Jorge Posada, who, on a one-on-one count, grounded one down the left field line to a waiting Longoria, who saw that Greg Golson was a bit too far down the line and he jumped on the opportunity. McGee followed that up by getting a huge strikeout on Corey Dickerson, and another soft grounder from Brett Gardner led to another jam escaped. In Baltimore, in the bottom of the ninth, Jonathan Papelbon comes out to secure the win, and at least get Boston to play another day. And he does his job, striking out Adam Jones and Mark Reynolds in dominant fashion. With the O's down to their final out, Chris Jones comes up and decides this game isn't over yet. A double down the line brings up Nolan Reimold, who gets into a 2-2 two and two hole. Down to their last strike, all Papel Bond has to do is finish it off. Reimold in the air, right center field, nobody's going to catch it! Robert Andino steps up now, and at this point, you just gotta wonder, what curse fell upon the Boston Red Sox in September? How did a team who had a nine-game lead at one point collapse this badly? And even still, despite everything, they had the chance to remedy it all tonight, but they blew it again. Can you hear the baseball gods laughing? It's improbable, but maybe they signed their fade away months ago. Maybe it can all be traced back to one man. Here's the 1 1 delivery. That is on the right field, and no, it's trapped! The Orioles coming to the plate, rival! They did it! They did it! They did it! The Orioles have beat the Red Sox! Two runs! B.J. Upton steps up to the plate in the bottom of the 12th, facing Scott Prater. He fouls one off, strike one. Watches one go wide, ball one. He swings and misses for strike two, and the crowd goes wild. And the Baltimore Orioles... 
Bulls have just beaten Boston. They've scored two in the bottom of the ninth against Papelbon, and the Orioles beat Boston four to three. With the Red Sox loss, all the Rays have to do is win, and they're in the playoffs. After clawing their way back all month, they now have the chance to finish the job. Moments later, with Upton down on strikes and Longoria up, the score is posted for all to see. And well, you all know what happens next. SB Nation estimates that given the factors available, how Boston had a 0.3% chance to miss the playoffs on September 3rd, the Rays had a 0.3% chance of coming back down 7 nothing in the 8th, Boston had a 2% chance of losing when Baltimore was down to their final strike, and the Rays had a 2% chance of winning with Johnson also down to his final strike. It all comes together to be a 1 in 278 million chance of everything turning out the way it did. It's unbelievable how improbable this night truly was, and this whole comeback throughout the entire month. The Rays surging perfectly coincided with Boston's collapse, with the final game being a microcosm of everything before it. The Rays should have had no chance. Boston should have easily run away with the wild card. But that's the magic of baseball. Nothing is absolute. Anything can happen. Even the craziest, wildest of possibilities. Do two and a line shot down the left field. Tonight, on September 28th, 2011, the Rays would cement themselves in the middle of perhaps the greatest night in all of baseball and show the world that nothing is truly impossible. <laughs>